we need businesses now to be net positive. And, and what that means is that the impact of the business kind of in, in every sphere of its existence on all stakeholders is positive. That's the ultimate goal. Um, almost impossible to do today perfectly. And there's no um, perfect solutions or when you ever make a, a choice, there's gonna be some pros and cons and you kind of are keeping, you keep working towards this goal, but we're defining net positive as being serving you know, all stakeholders and shareholders kind of come last. You're serving the world, you're serving stakeholders and that in every kind of phase and every scale, every product, every service, every community, every employee, the world, you have a positive impact. Um, and that doesn't mean, oh, I emit over here and I buy some offsets over here. It's the goal is again, at every scale, you're having a positive impact. Andrew Winston is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by Innovators Magazine and 1.5 Media. Andrew is the founder of Winston Eco Strategies, which is a globally recognized expert on how companies can profit from solving the world's biggest challenges. His views on strategy have been sought after by many of the world's leading companies, including 3M, DuPont, HP, Ingersoll Rand, J&J, Kimberly Clark, Marriott, PepsiCo, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and Unilever. Andrew's book, The Big Pivot, was selected as one of the best business, business books by Strategy and Business. I've got it right here. It's a fabulous read, and we're going to talk about it today as well. Andrew's first book, Green to Gold, was the top-selling green business title of the last decade. There it is, Green to Gold selling more than 100,000 copies in seven languages. Inc. Magazine included Green to Gold on its all-time list of 30 books that every manager could own. Andrew is also a regular contributor to Harvard Business Review, MIT Sloan Management Review, and other media outlets. He has been quoted or appeared in major media such as Bloomberg, The Wall Street Journal, Time, Business Week, New York Times, and CNBC. Andrew's speeches around the globe include a TED Talk, provide a practical and optimistic roadmap to help leaders build thriving, resilient companies in a volatile world. He received degrees in economics, business, and environmental management from Princeton, Columbia, and Yale. Andrew, thanks for being on the show. I'm so glad that you're here. Thanks so much. Well, that was the long bio. I don't think we have any more time left. We probably have to. No, we got through. plenty. We've got that was great. Plenty. And thanks for selling the books. You have the original hardcover of, of Green to Gold. It's going way back. I, I, I do. And I also have the Green Recovery here. It's kind of the tickles, tickles even, uh, 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 even other beginnings. I just love them all. Thank and you. Um, I, I'm really excited about what's on the road. We're going to talk about some of your other books. I actually ch chose your shortest bio because in reality, you've been doing this for a long time. You go way back. You're very knowledgeable. And uh, I could probably spend an hour just on your bio because you, you've done this. But that leads nicely to my first question. We've just had a hell of a, a, a 12 months uh, Crazy Times, Inauguration, Black Lives Matters, GOP, uh, Brexit, um, now just what happened in Atlanta with the, the, the yeah. Uh, um, yeah, craziness with the Asians, uh, 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 racist violence, and, and all sorts of other crazinesses with the pandemic and COVID mutations. Um, because you've been talking about the bigger picture sustainability, resilience, biodiversity, integrating things and into business models, changing the way we do and operate. Has any of that given you some resilience to weather this crazy time? And, and how have you been? Yeah, I mean, so you mean personal personal resilience? Well, um, well, both. I mean, I hope you have personal resilience that you're yeah. practicing what you preach. I'm sure you do. Well, look, I mean, look, I, I'll be honest, it's, um, these have been a hard, you know, this was a hard four years. I've, I've um, you know, here we are in 2021. I've noticed the last few weeks, I've actually been sleeping a lot better. I didn't, I didn't sleep very well for years. And my wife turned to me this morning and just said, 
maybe it really was the orange guy that was just keeping you up at night. I was like, well, it didn't help. I mean, like there was, there was this constant assault on my values, right? Every day um, as we were going in pretty much the wrong direction on almost every topic imaginable. Um, and so it's been a relief the last you know, couple of months to see an administration I agree with in the US, right? And not just agree with, but I think they're following science, they're doing the things they need to, and their focus on climate is unparalleled. We've never seen anything quite like this. So personally, I am doing better, I think. But, but look, we have, we have serious problems, right? I mean, it is, a, it is a strange existence, as you know, being a sustainability person, because we could, we could talk about all the things that have gotten so much better in, in the last 10, 20 years, you know, from actual huge reductions in poverty to um, real shifts in the way business is thinking about this and the financial community finally, like business is doing more and more, absolutely. So the, the, the stuff I focus on the private sector more than ever, but you know, as you know, and probably your listeners know, we're also losing at the same time, the science is getting worse and um, on climate in particular, but inequality has been, uh, it's a topic I didn't spend a lot of time on earlier in my sustainability career, but now it's just so compelling and so ridiculous. Um, what happened to wealth during the pandemic right, was that the world's billionaires gained another trillion. Um, so we're at this time where we actually have the capital, like there's money out there to do most of what we need to do. It's just in so few hands. Um, and this just can't, it just doesn't seem like it can continue. So uh, we have a lot of work to do. I mean, the U.S. is, I think, still on a knife's edge as a democracy. I think we're, we're fighting, you know, frankly, people who want to overturn democracy and block huge portions of people from voting. And they're riling up, as you mentioned, kind of racist violence. It's a dangerous time, you know, but I will say that I feel like throughout history, everyone always thinks they're living in the craziest time, the one where the world's about to end. It, it does feel like this is different. I know we probably always think that every generation, but the things we're talking about are now at the global scale, right? I mean, there were always threats to society at their, the city state scale or whatever, back at Sparta, you know, whatever it is, but now it really is global. Um, and we better come together or we can make the, the planet pretty much uninhabitable. So it, it does feel like this is it, right? Like we've got 10, 20, 30 years um, to really set the next few centuries and whether we thrive or not. So it's, it's a exciting time, I guess, but it is, it, I, it is incredibly stressful. I mean, it's, you know, if you follow this stuff and you're in the climate world, it's, it's tough. The, the data is not good. So that's a long way of saying like I'm managing my mood as best I can and try to focus on the the upside, but we gotta we gotta take in what needs work and what what's a problem. I, I want to go even deeper. So I love uh, thanks for the personal insights and and I, I expect to know less. Um, I'm also right there with you. Uh, what a horrific time with uh, with the orange guy exactly. Um, I, I I couldn't believe it. In in some respects. <clears throat> not only with the pandemic and the, the great pause, the great reset now that the World Economic Forum is, is, is discussing. I, I wanna ask all those people for the years, decades that you spoke to them about sustainability, environmental, social governance, corporate social responsibility, telling them not only in your books, but in your lectures and your reviews, it's a better business model. People wake up. This is a better business model. It's better for your company. It's better for your triple bottom line. It's on and on. Um, were they knocking down your door? Were they like, holy hell, we didn't listen to you, Andrew. Um, can you help us get out of this trouble? Can you get us back up to speed? Did you experience any of that? And, and can, can you tell us maybe in that respect on those where you were you preaching to the choir or did some people say, no, we didn't listen, even though you told us and, and now we need your help? Yeah, well, I'd like to take credit, like people are coming to me like I was the one telling them, I think I've been yeah. a voice, there's certainly been plenty. Yeah. Look, I think, as I said before, the business community is moving now in a way we've never seen. I think you, you can't deny that in the last, especially kind of five years, you know, the idea of something like science-based targets, goals, you know, to, to cut carbon at the pace we need to. I wrote about that in Big Pivot in 2014 and everyone, I got a lot of pushback. Like, why would a company do this? Why, you know, it's not necessarily to their advantage. And it became the norm over the last you know, few years. And now it's like table stakes. So there's been movement, obviously. I think the, the battle's over to get this on the agenda everywhere, right? I mean, that's, that's true. I don't know if people have been knocking down my door, but I do think, we, like I said, we've won the battle. 
you now have pretty much every large company getting, they got to do something. There's still a surprising number that are pretty far back that haven't done much. I, I talk to companies regularly that they don't even really have a carbon footprint of their business yet. I mean, there's, there's fewer and fewer of those, but there's some surprising, you know, gaps. And, and so I, I think we, like I said, I think we all won the first battle, like whatever you want to call it, the first inning is over or whatever. And now we've kind of got to accelerate at a, at a real pace. Um, I don't know if you're ever going to get a, like we told you so, or, or you were right. You know, I'm not sure we get that from the business community. They kind of, they come along when they're like, when they see it as a, as a good business case, they're like, oh, we get it. It's a good business case. Like now we get it, you know, like, but I had a, on this point, I had a conversation with a, a, a CEO a number of years ago now, and he had, I had spoken at their company a few times and he said, you know, the first time I heard you, I thought well, he doesn't know, he's, he doesn't know what I'm, what our business is. He doesn't understand. And then the second time I was like, no, he's saying something, I guess there's something there. And then the third time he's like, oh, this guy's probably right. Like it was like, he talked about that transition. Um, and I think we see that in this field, everyone who's done this, that you kind of have to like all change. How many times does someone need to hear a message, right? How many times do we all need to read something about our health before we kind of <laughs> take it on? You know, how many years did I talk about doing meditation before I finally did it? You know, it's, I, I think the companies, they need to hear it repeatedly. But what's changed lately that gives me a lot of hope is the financial communities finally, they really are finally there. And that's made a huge difference because companies are hearing it from their investors. That's, let's face it, for some of these CEOs, that's all they really care about. And, yeah, and it's the bottom line, the it's the profit, it's the investments, it's the board. Um, uh, absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm right there with you. I've, I've, I've had people who've actually physically sat in five of my lectures or presentations and it wasn't until the fifth time they're like, at, at first they're like, oh, Mark's just repeating the same stuff he's been repeating before. And then after I'm done, they're like, God, that's the first time I've heard that. I finally get it. I understand it, it takes a few times. And I think it's because people are in a different mindset. They're, they're, you have to pick them up where they're at. And sometimes it takes four or five times until they hear it, until they understand it. The thing I totally agree with you on is um, ESG, uh, Sustainable Index Funds, first, second, third, and fourth quarter of 2020 just blew uh, conventional funds out of the water. Uh, to, to, you know, 25 out of 28, Morningstar reviews, Nikki, NASDAQ, any, any, any uh, index you can think of, a sustainable index funds outperform their conventional counterparts. So the proof is in the money and the returns and, and, and how they perform in a crisis, in a pandemic. Yeah. But I, I really want to go even deeper now um, a little bit with what I tickled on on the GOP. So not only craziness and all this stuff, I, I, I want to know you, I, I'm from the US, I live in Germany, I've kind of, I've got an arm's length distance, but my heart, my heart is in the USA. And so uh, the whole time the green guy or the orange guy was there, I was like, you know, couldn't believe the craziness calling my family saying, you know, what's going on. And now it, it really hasn't stopped. I see Biden doubling down uh, quickly, right after his inauguration, signing us uh, back into the Paris Agreement, signing a lot of positive things for electrification, for transitions, which, which is perfect, and a huge step in the right direction and really gives hope. I was really hoping that, that there would be something tied to fix the political system, the governments, voting how can we fix a thing that should have been taken care of decades ago we're talking about putting people to mars and space and and emerging technologies who can't even figure out a vote and if it's been rigged or not or, or you know whatever the issues are so uh, maybe you can answer me some of those thoughts and feelings that you have i know you're you probably have a few well i mean I it's been impossible. Look, I'm interested in po like politics or whatever you want to call it. I think I think politics is always the wrong word. A lot of what we've taught, you know, been focused on for years. It's really about values. You know, what do we value? And we can call it politics. But you know, at first you can say, look, why are these two guys talking about politics, sustainability? Well, what I learned, I guess, you know, when when Trump was elected was, I thought, you know, I've been working on climate for years. To me, that was the fundamental existential threat. If we didn't solve that, you know, we were in trouble. And then all of a sudden there was a there was another threat that was a precursor, which was a threat to democracy. Like if we don't have a functioning democracy, we're not going to tackle 
climate very well, right? I mean, you know, we're, we're not going to handle our, our biggest issues. So all of a sudden, to me, the most pressing thing was how do we get a working democracy? So I actually think when I said we're still facing some serious challenges, look, we have there's 240 or something, you know, laws being proposed in states around the US and 40 plus states to restrict voting, to basically block black and brown people from voting. I mean, that's the fundamental thing. And, and we keep pretending like the news tries to pretend there's two sides to everything. Look, this is a GOP effort. This isn't a partisan statement. This is just fact. There's a GOP effort to try to restrict voting. So the most important thing for sustainability for the future is this bill, HR1 in the US, that, that will protect voting, will really uh, slow down gerrymandering, will make it you know, um, independent commissions for, for the kind of districts, uh, allow people early voting, all of that. And then you get into all this like detailed about the politics in our country, which is, well, then there's the filibuster. So the Senate blocks everything. And so you have to stop the filibuster. There's all these like, these, these kind of steps that get you back to this very basic set of things that need to happen. And if we don't stop the filibuster on the voting thing, then frankly, minority rule could be locked in in the US for a long time because the electoral college is structured so that small states have a lot of power and there's been tremendous gerrymandering. So you have right now a party in the GOP that has not won the popular vote. They've won one popular vote in 30 years, I think in the presidency, and they haven't won by more votes in the Senate or House in years. And the Democrats actually, Democrats actually get the most votes, but they can still lose the House because where the seats are. So it's a, it's a really wonky thing. And, and yet it's the most important conversation right now in the US. We can do a lot on climate through executive order, through the cabinet, and it's all great, but we need some serious action, right? We need to get to prices on carbon around the world. We need global negotiations on, on you know, prices across borders. We're not gonna do that with frankly one party that's against democracy and against any action on climate but almost to a person um we keep waiting for gop kind of climate related thinking to happen and it just it keeps not happening we keep waiting and waiting and so i've kind of hit this point where i feel like the only thing i know will work is that the party that does vote for climate action is in control like i i we keep waiting for some bipartisan version but I don't see it coming. And I know people working on this for years and really believe we're about to get there, like that there's a bunch of senators and congressmen in the, in the Republican Party who are ready to bolt from climate denial. But I've heard that for years and I'm just, I'm ready to be wrong. I'm happy to be wrong. But right now we don't have time. I don't think we have time to convince a bunch of people. We just have to, we have to have people in power who want to do something about it. You know, that's the fundamental reality. And it's, it, it gets you into a whole bunch of stuff in the U.S. that is I never thought I'd think about like the filibuster, you know, but like we have to. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Do you do you believe that some of these things are just <clears throat> straying us from our eye on the real prize or on the on, on the future where we really need to go? Are these just divergence to to hold us back to something? Uh, uh, because I mean, you honestly, in the whole time you've been doing this, the the message that we don't have time. Yeah. My message, we don't have time. I just had Ingmar Rendholz from We Don't Have Time app and, and sustainability on my show uh, yeah. uh, re released on Tuesday. We don't have time. Yeah. Uh, sorry, screws my French. And I know this might not, we don't fucking have time. What, what's the deal? Why are, we, why are we still messing around when we're, we're in, we're in, we're, we should be in the digital age. We should really be applying these emerging technologies. We're going to Mars, we're going to the moon, mm -hmm. we're, we're doing all these amazing things, but we can't figure out some basic fundamental core things that should be fixed. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Is it, is it a delay tactic? Is it, what's the point? Well, look, I mean, there's, there's vested interests, right? There's, you know, if you're in the fossil fuel business, the value of your company, if you admit publicly or if you help in any way to move away from fossil fuels, the value of your company plummets, which has happened in the last few years, right? I mean, there was all the divestment movement and universities and organizations said, no, we're not going to divest. And they would have been so much better off if they had, you know, coal companies went bankrupt, oil and gas companies lost value. Um, you know, I was just looking at the valuation of like um, Orsted, you know, as a, as a energy company in, in Europe, they're the biggest offshore wind company in the world. Um, and they were all oil and gas 10, 15 years ago, and they made this big pivot. 
they're like 10 billion in revenue US dollars. And they have a market cap of like 60, 60 billion. BP has a market cap of 90 billion, only like, you know, 30 billion more and has like 30 times the revenue. So like the, the market is clearly starting to value the future technologies in a very real way and recognize that oil and gas has a tough future. But look, everything they've done to try to block action makes sense from their profit maximization perspective. It, it's our fault, I guess, as a society, as a po political body that we've let them, right? That, that of course they're gonna do this if they think in very short run you know, if you're a CEO, you're going to be there five years, you want your stock to go up, you're going to protect oil and gas. But that's, that's what, you know, the rest of us, other companies should be pushing on. I think there's been a huge gap. And so one of the big things I think companies really need to think about in their sustainability efforts is their advocacy. And everybody who's not fossil fuels needs to be pushing pretty hard for there to be prices on carbon, higher fuel efficiency standards, all the things we need, because this is life and death, right? This is, their businesses will not thrive you know, there's, it's incompatible to have fossil fuels thrive and basically everybody else thrive. So the question is, will everybody else get off the sidelines? And they're starting to, um, you're seeing more of it, but companies have been pretty quiet, you know, on, on climate action. Um, they've worried about it being political football, right? It's turned into this politicization of something that's scientific, right? I mean, the, the fossil fuel companies and, and some voices, you know, on the right, convince people that a science issue with political ramifications was a political issue with some science. <laughs> like, and it, that's kind of nuts, right? And we saw the same thing with the pandemic. Um, even I was surprised by that. I didn't think people would debate whether masks work. I, 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 I just didn't think that was a thing that could happen. Um, and they're still doing it. They're still saying masks don't work. I'm like, really? Then why have they been wearing them in operating rooms for, you know, a hundred years? I mean, there's just, there's an anti-science you know, kind of holding on to the past in some weird way that is really dangerous. It's to me, it's almost more dangerous than even the democracy stuff. Anti-fact, anti-science, then nothing matters, right? How do you decide anything? The, the wonderful thing I like about the big pivot, your book um, came out in 2014 as a real pivotal, is you, you make no bones to say, you know, we're, there's Paul Hawken, there's, um, Herman Daly, there's William McDonough, there's uh, Paul Pullman. There's many greats that you kind of discuss or mention. Uh, so old wisdoms, old writings, um, John Elkington, you know, on and on that you touch on these great books, these great people who have been speaking about it also for a long time, but also connecting the dots. One of the very first points, science-based targets that you actually use the words and because the book's a little older, science-based goals, right. um, the same thing, science-based targets. Um, and, and you have this, a, a format, so a, a unique structure, not only the vision, the valuation, the partnering, the, the different cores uh, models, not only of your chapters, but just how businesses are, are missing, they're leaving money at the table they're missing total big opportunities of, of where they can go and um the book is from a, a, it's not only a page term but from beginning to end it's full of, of frameworks and value for especially and and that's so fitting that it's a harvard business review uh book and that you've talked about it forever that it's such a wonderful tool to get people to finally um pull their head out and realize that there is a better model, a better operating system. And you, you touched on it so well. So our around the world, our uh, humanity is feeling this dis-ease, this unrest that the current civilization frameworks, the models, whether we're in the US or Brexit or the Amazon Bolsonaro's or wherever, that these frameworks, these models of what we thought were democracy are just not working for us anymore. They're not at a global level. These organizations that we are talking about are all global, pretty much all global companies yeah. already operating on a global model, but finding their cherry picking or meandering or their okay, I'm going to do this and let's do it in the U.S. or let's do it in Jersey or let's find a tax oasis here or, or however they do their structures. 
but they're getting away from the bigger picture that we need a global unified new model for, yeah. for our world, a better, a better operation, uh, operating system. And, and I see those tools that you're talking about in the book, but I uh, also really love, you know, you talk about Kimberly Clark, you talk about Unilever, you talk about companies and organizations that really um, you've worked with or that have firm examples of positive results where they've made the changes. And that's why I'd actually hope that um, since it is a Harvard Business Review, that more people would have reached out to you and said, hey, we've read your book in the pandemic. We've just been at home office for 12 months. Now we'd like to get back to business, but we'd like to do one that's going to be around for a couple of decades into the future. And we want your help in applying some of this uh, stuff in your book. What do you have to say uh, to, to people who haven't read this, who who are still operating on an old business model? Uh, you know, look, I, I, yes, yeah, certainly I, I, people reach out. I do a lot of speaking. I do consulting. I'm on advisory boards. So, I, you know, I talk to a lot of companies and there's, you know, peers and colleagues that do what I do that are working with lots of companies as well. I mean, it's, I, one of the, I think, pleasant surprises in the last year was in the past, whenever there's been, uh, you know, especially a financial challenge or there's been kind of real issues in the world, sustainability takes a back seat, right? Companies lay off people or they, you know, they stop focusing on it. And that didn't happen this time. Um, companies were maybe most of them too far along, uh, you know, Unilever, Walmart, all the, all the typical guys, but they, you know, they didn't just tread water, they accelerated, the goals got bigger. Google, all these guys like increased their goals. There was a lot of momentum already um, towards net zero and the number of goals in the last, you know, just this year in 2021, every day, literally, there's another company saying we're going to be net zero by 2040 or 2050. So the acceleration of action has been kind of amazing in a time where people could have, you know, hunkered down and just focused on, you know, survival. And certainly some sectors did. If you're in hospitality, nobody's expecting Marriott to put out a bunch of sustainability goals. Like, if, you know, there's, there's some companies that just are, you know, they're 90% of their business disappeared in a week, you know, a year ago. So, but I've been amazed at how much there's still been activity. And I, and I hear from, you know, peers, people in sustainability consulting, their business is doing really well. And I'm on the, the board of an NGO that, you know, advises companies and they're doing much better than they thought. You know, they had this plan for like revenue is going to shrink this much. And, you know, it's been a pleasant surprise like that we're continuing. And I think it's because the, the mega trends, the forces I always talk about and work on, they're real. I mean, it's not just like some theory. Companies are seeing climate change, you know, they're feeling it. Companies are feeling the pressure from millennials and Gen Z. They're, you know, they're, they're dealing with new levels of transparency. They're, the clean economy has gotten so much cheaper that they're, they're frankly dumb not to be pursuing it, right? It's just cheaper. So all the forces are kind of actually moving us in, in the right direction, except for the one you mentioned, which is the, the decline of democracy. And the movement in the last five, 10 years towards kind of an every person for themselves view of the world, right? So much more nationalism, right when we need like true global thinking and collective action and some sense that we are all connected. I think the, the pandemic, I think increased a sense of that. Like we kind of started to get that we all share an immune system, like quite literally. Um, and maybe that's helped see people, but it's also made some people put up their walls. Right, like if we just block everyone out, we won't get sick or something, which just doesn't work. I mean, so I'm hoping that what comes out of this is a much greater sense of partnership and collaboration that we need. The problems are just way too big for any company or any country or anybody to do alone. So we're gonna need collaboration and I'm hoping that that's one of the things that comes out of all this, this period of incredible volatility. I, on, on my podcast, Inside Ideas, I had um, <clears throat> Shalanda Baker. She became the deputy director of the Department of Energy uh, right after the podcast for, for the Biden-Harris administration. Um, it, it was really interesting because she, in her book, uh, Revolution to Power, she, she actually writes about this racial in, inequality and the problems in democracy for um, energy, for just getting out simple basic utilities and energy for people and how uh, 
uh, a lot of indigenous and, 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 and it's a big racial thing. You're thinking electricity, power, utilities, how could that be, you know? And so I, I, I have strong hope when the right leadership is in place that sees that, addresses that. Uh, Biden's a big person on mobile transfer, transportation, trains, mobility, and things as well. So I like those steps in the right direction. But there's something fundamentally wrong at the core values of, of the U.S. democracy and, and the political system that I think needs to be fixed. Otherwise, we're going to we could face replaying this in the future sometime or when the next vote comes that, that we're dealing with some of these same issues. The part of the craziness is, is the U.S. is, is this isn't the first Atlantic uh, uh, Atlanta shootings that just occurred to the Asian ladies, uh, that's not new. We've had other mm -hmm. racial problems already and, and within the last 12 months. So how do we, um, you know, I, I hate to make your, your book and your work and what you work on in that, but I think that's something that maybe even I've missed over the past. How do we fix that so that we don't run into another time where we're, we have this great pause or this great yeah. reset again, because we're waiting for our leaders to catch up and get us to where we need to be. So I, you and I are going to fix racism now, right? We're going to, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> look, I, I, you know, look, it's, we're two white guys talking about this, but I will say that I considered myself pretty aware, pretty empathetic, but, you know, even for those of us who were aware of the data and, and the level of racism, I'm Jewish. I've certainly seen anti-Semitism pretty consistent. It's always the Jews fault. Apparently it's George Soros, you know, there, this stuff is always there. I've been surprised, you know, at, at the level that came out in the U.S. Um, but it's it's not just the U.S., right? There's Hindu-Muslim violence in India. Uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil could not care less about indigenous people and how many are dying of COVID. You know, there's there's a decline in kind of caring for subsets of people in countries in a lot of places. You know, but the awareness level that came from George Floyd's murder. There are these pivot points. These these times in life where there's a tipping point. And there have been other people who had died. There have been other videos of people dying. Something clicked, right, with this. And it was so awful and so compelling and horrendous that all of a sudden you saw every organization, every large company put out statements about racial equity and have been following it up with a lot of goals, a lot of you know efforts to improve, um, you know, increase the representation. And I think that's that's what this all ends up coming down to is, we call it diversity and inclusion, but increasing representation across leadership. I mean, look at look at Biden's cabinet, right? It looks like America after what was literally all old white guys, you know, under under Orange Man, and we now have much more representation. And you're seeing the goal of that, at least. And there's a long way to go in business. I mean, I just was writing this in my new book, but there are four um, in the Fortune 500. There are four black CEOs. Uh, you know, that's that's absurd, right? I mean, that's, so there's there's this at least target now in many companies to increase greatly the representation. And I think once you have a more inclusive, you know, set of organizations in the world institutions, they naturally become more democratic, right? They represent people better inside and outside. And I think that's the next big goal, I think, for companies. And that increases, I believe, the, com the, more, the more small d democratic we are um, as a as a country, as a world. If we look like the world, if a company looks like the world outside, and if the people in power look like the world, how can it not be better for everybody? You know, and I mean everybody, even the people that think they're losing ground. Um, you know, they're in it together more than they realize. So I'm hoping that this awareness from Black Lives Matter, Me Too, that it isn't going away. It doesn't seem to be. It, it seems like there's real efforts now, and and I think. That's gonna and look, look. That's why there's a backlash, right? There's a there's an old white male feeling like they're losing something, and it's hard to make them feel better about it. But the world is just not is not going to be very productive, or it's not going to thrive without making these changes happen. So I'm I'm and, optimistic. Yeah, I, I'm I'm glad because we need lots of optimism. We need to make it happen. In your book, you give numerous uh, great examples. But there is one that can kind of be applicable that, the way I see it, the way I read it out. And I don't, I don't want to be the interpreter, but I, 
I think you move in this direction as well. Um, and it's with Tiger Woods, how someone on, on he, he, does a, he, he, he does a drop or he does a shot mm -hmm. that's against the rules, but the judges on the ground in the game didn't see it. But someone at home in the armchair of their TV who was knowledgeable enough about golf or something, or maybe even been in, in the thing, uh, sends an email or a text message in right. uh, about it. And the next thing you know, he's he's behind the lead and could have faced total disqualification yeah. and it lost him the lead. Uh, and so now you've got these people at home that are, are thrice removed almost from the game, but have an influence. And, and it's just telling that it's not only with your sustainability issues. I mean, we've seen it with uh, the, the um, production facilities in India. You also mentioned that in your book and some other, other things, how quickly it can go if you're not prepared, if you don't apply some of these things to react quickly and kind of do some self-monitoring and preparation. In that, in that frame of that, are there some principles, some models that you would recommend people um, kind of step up to the plate and, and, and apply now, whether it's in, in the whole democracy or whether it's just uh, this other real time virtual space that we've come, we've come about to, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a fun story about Tiger Woods because it just, it was to me just a story of transparency and how, we're, you know, it was fairly early, right, in the, in the realm of real time reaction to something and changing, like, a, a, tournaments happening on TV real time and it ends up changing the game because someone sees something, uh, you know, that's, we take a lot of that for granted now that, you know, you can uh, almost real time have a reaction to something or rile up people or the fact that the, the biggest band in the world, BTS, played around with getting their fans to, to screw up some of Trump's rallies. I mean, they're, the weirdest stuff has happened that show that we can, you can, um, drive huge numbers of people. And I think, um, I think the Parkland teens were kind of a, pi a pivot point where they, they came out of this tragedy, they gathered millions of Twitter followers in a week or two and called for people to take to the streets. And like in three weeks, it was one of the biggest, you know, global rallies for peace. And then, and then Greta Thunberg took that, watched them and said, I can do this with climate. There's an ability to mobilize now that I think companies need to get their heads around how fast it can happen. You've seen Amazon in the last few years got pressured by their own employees who kind of went very public about, you know, um, about their feelings about climate change and it changed Amazon. So I think, I don't know. I mean, there's principles of just understanding how transparent the world is. And I guess the principle I'd say is be proactive, right? And be, you know, there's the kind of famous line I've used in a few things I use in, in Big Pivot about um, if, if, uh, if we're all gonna be naked, you better be buff. Right. It's this, you know, people, a lot of people have said that, you know, if we're going to be very transparent, then you better be ready for that. And the principle is, it sounds kind of obvious, but don't do anything you'd be embarrassed about or that's wrong. I mean, it's the same, it's that logic of, you know, if something you said or wrote were on the front page of the New York Times, would you feel comfortable? Like companies have to think like that and understand the pace um, that things get out. Right. We've seen so many examples in the last few years. Starbucks has a bad situation with two you know, African-American that get kicked out and it's viral, like within minutes, you know, like this stuff goes, can go around the world so quickly. I think companies need to, they need to understand that and understand that every person, including their employees is carrying around um, a phone. They're, they're, they have an ability to film anything. They're kind of auditing you in real time. So I, I think just understanding that and being ready for that is, is something companies are, can struggle with. Um, that there's really no, there's not that level of privacy that they think they had. It's just, everything's gonna be out in the open. I think that's generally a good thing. You know, I think it, it will help for the most part, but just be ready for that. I love that level of transparency and to be ready and uh, almost think companies and organizations are in some respects held to a little bit higher standard or, or that there's a difference there. Because honestly, and I don't know if you want to comment to this or if we even should, I, I was blown away. It was unimaginable. Some of the shit that Donald Trump tweeted and the open and transparency of what a freaking idiot he was that he posted and, and why twice he wouldn't get impeached or why um, none of those 
tweets or actions that he did openly transparent that made him look like an idiot, made others just right out racist, would not have that same effect, which tells me at the core that there's some kind of issue with democracy, with the GOP. There's some influence there that I just don't understand, but that's hampering uh, humanity. Um, I don't know if you want to make a comment, probably it's better, better not to be I, look, I, mean, look, I you know, we could pretend that we should avoid talking about politics. Like I said before, we can't, we're not going to solve inequality and climate change, whatever, without more functioning democracy and politics. And look, look, we got to be honest in the U S 147 members of the GOP, just one party voted to overturn a free and fair election. They've been telling the big lie. They still are regularly um, Senator Ron Johnson from Wisconsin keeps saying, and they keep saying things like the, the coup attempt. I mean, again, I have to use the phrase the coup attempt in the US and it still feels surreal. We're gonna look back at this time as a pretty scary time in the US, but they're still saying, oh, it was Antifa or it was Black Lives Matter. There is not only zero evidence, it's ridiculous, right? I mean, it's like all the people there were proud Trump supporters and believe that it was stolen from them because they've been told that. So. I, you know, there's, again, I think we got to be talking honestly and not pretend that there's like both sides to this stuff. And look, this isn't just me saying this sounding like some partisan or some sustainability advocate. Dozens of large companies pulled their funding from politicians and in particular from those 147 members of the Congress. I had never seen anything like that. And I think, you know, in the last few months, we've seen, again, a, a continued shift in what's expected of companies, what they expect of themselves their role in society, that they got involved enough to say, we're not gonna fund these people that tried to overthrow the government. Um, you know, That's a good sign because if, if we can't police ourselves because the checks and balances are kind of broken or the voting system is gamed, the business community has a role, right? They can, they can push back and say, we're not gonna fund you. We're not gonna support your candidacy. You know, the question is, will they, will they stick to it? Will they you know, just have done it while it was you know, kind of public and will they, will they continue to, to not fund the people that didn't want democracy to function? Um, so we'll see, but that was new. I've never seen companies kind of, they've always say we're not political, we can give to both sides. And they, a bunch of them came right out and said, we're not funding these guys. That was a good sign. And I think, I, I think the next step from there is will they pull back money from climate deniers? Will they pull back money from those that are, you know, supporting racist policies and voter suppression? I'm hoping, and I think just in the last few days, Coca-Cola, UPS, a bunch of Atlanta-based companies came out publicly and said, the voter suppression rules that they're trying to put in place in Georgia, we don't agree with. Because companies have a huge portion of black and Latino employees and customers, and like they can't suppress and you know don't want to. They're actually, on some level, multinationals are more progressive, if you want to call it, than the government. You know, they, they have, they've been further ahead on LGBT for years, right? Re re you know, recognizing domestic partnerships because they have gay employees and gay customers. And like, they just, it's because it's the money, right? I mean, it's just good for business to like serve everybody. So, you know, we'll see. I think business can be a huge force for good here. Well, I'm, I'm excited about what's coming down the line. And I'm hoping you'll, you'll tease us a little bit with a, uh, um, Net positive, I can see just this glimmering of your book behind you. Uh, that's the manuscript that you've submitted. I was wondering if you could you could tease it a little bit for us. Tell us what we can look forward to um, in that. Yeah, so the, the new book that's coming out in um, September of 2021, um, I've been co-authoring writing for the last year and a half with Paul Pullman, who, who ran Unilever for a decade. And you know, Unilever has been ranked um, the Globe Scan survey every year of kind of asking people who are knowledgeable who's the most sustainable. Unilever has been ranked number one for 10 years. So there's some validity to it. It's not a perfect company, right? I mean, nobody is. They're not sustainable. Nobody is. But there's a lot to learn from them and from Paul's approach. So we've been, you know, writing this book together. The manuscript's in. It'll be out. You know, the idea is it's not radically different from Big Pivot, but it's kind of pushing it even further. The idea is that we need businesses now to be net positive. And, and what that means is that the impact of the business kind of in, in every sphere of its existence on all stakeholders is positive. That's the ultimate goal. Um, almost impossible to do today perfectly. And there's no um, 
perfect solutions or when you ever make a, a choice, there's going to be some pros and cons and you kind of are keeping, you keep working towards this goal, but we're defining net positive as being serving, you know, all stakeholders and shareholders kind of come last. You're serving the world, you're serving stakeholders and that in every kind of phase and every scale, every product, every service, every community, every employee, the world, you have a positive impact. Um, and that doesn't mean, oh, I emit over here and I buy some offsets over here. It's the goal is again, at every scale, you're having a positive impact. Um, that's a big goal, right? And, and so the book lays out a lot of um, kind of strategies and principles about how do we get, get there? What does it look like? What does a company look like that really thinks long-term serves stakeholders and grows over time, isn't afraid to say we should grow, we should profit and grows because of this by serving the world um, and shareholders will do just fine, right? That's kind of the, the fundamental principle. There's a lot in the book about goal setting, like, like I have in my previous books about kind of thinking really big. And then the core of the book is really about partnerships and collaboration, which um, you know I think Paul and Unilever have been world leaders on. I mean, they're involved in pretty much every partnership you see um, out there and how challenging it is to do partnerships and how the scale of our kind of vision on this has to grow so that partnerships um, move more and more into the full systems change realm where you're working with government, with peers, with NGOs, academics, everyone at the table saying, how do we change the system? What's the rules we need? What's the regulations we need? How do we work together as a value chain to really solve the problems together? We're not gonna, no one's gonna do it alone. Um, so we, we go through a lot of different kinds of partnerships from you, know, you and your suppliers, just your value chain up to the whole system. And, and we also tackle some things that nobody likes to talk about that we say we call you know, the elephants in the room, taxes, corruption, human rights, diversity and inclusion, these things that companies have done lots wrong on and still like to think they're being a positive influence. But you know, we say in there like, how can you be net positive if you don't pay taxes, right? Which dozens of companies avoid taxes. It's just not acceptable. Um, so we're trying to push the boundaries of what companies think are in their sphere of focus to be a sustainable company and push it to the full, the full world, your impact on the entire world. It's big thinking. We'll see if it goes over well. I hope it does. I hope it helps companies think bigger. I'm excited about it when it finally comes out. Um, writing a book is a horrible process, but having a book is great um, once it's out. You know, and I'm past Absolutely. most of the pain, so it's uh, I'm, I'm in a good mood about it. That's so great. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to that. It's uh, really wonderful that you're you're working with uh, such a wonderful guy and, and a giant in the industry. What most people really don't know is that he's an original SDG advocate, still an SDG advocate. Um, he was also the CFO from Nestle. Most people don't even know that. So. And most people's view, Nestle's kind of the evil company. Unilever's, you, because of Paul, I think had a little bit better rap. But CFO, I think there was a lot of learnings that um, that can be taken away from that. That I guess he's had ingrained with him um, to say, okay, we're going to do it different. We're going to do it better. We're going to try to uh, talk about corruption. And that comes from a lot of his other affiliations with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, Global Compact. There's some really anti-money laundering, know your uh, customer, all, all these CYK um, things around those organizations where they're looking at the bigger picture. They're looking about out for humanity. And, and I really love that with Paul, but he's since, I don't know if you touch upon this in the book and I don't want to tease it too much before it's out, but he, he's moved on from Unilever and now has his own organization, Imagine, which I'm hearing wonderful things as well from. Um, so I definitely want to talk to you again when that comes out yeah. after I've read it and, 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 and we'll have a discussion about that as well. So that's, that's fabulous. Um, I want to get into uh, probably five more big questions, some kind of existential, we'll move away from politics and all the uh, other craziness that, that we had. The first one is, do you feel like a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without divisions, nations, borders, humanity, one from another? Um, what are your thoughts, your feelings, your views on that? Yeah, I mean, look, we, like I said, we're, we're in this pendulum swing towards every man for themselves, nationalism. I, look, I don't know if 
fully global citizen, what that would look like or whether it makes sense. I'm, you know, I, I can be proud of many things about America, but also think there's some serious problems here. Um, yeah, I mean, generally, I do think I'm a, a global citizen because I get that we're all connected. Like I said, we have one immune system. We're breathing the same air. Uh, you know, a microgram of carbon over here warms the planet everywhere. So I just, to me, it's just been always practical. I got into this whole field coming from regular business jobs from a practical perspective, just looking at like, you know, resource use and going, wow, we can't keep doing what we're doing, right? I mean, it goes back to Silent Spring. I'm like, we just can't keep doing what we're doing and have the planet function well. So it's always been very practical to me. So yeah, we're just to say like, we're all connected because we are. I mean, it's just, it's lunacy to pretend that we can do this in like little pockets, you know, country by country. And I do think, you know, we are, people obviously are inherently tribal. It's one of our kind of things. It's why we have these kinds of USA, USA, or your state, your town, whatever unit, your school, you know, like every, we find tribes, right? We always do. And I think, I think there's a little bit more of some global tribes, especially younger generations. I think Gen Z might see themselves as global citizens more and, and there's global entertainment like BTS this Korean pop band is the world's biggest band, you know, like there's more global kind of because everything's online now and almost everyone now has a cell phone six point something billion of the seven billion 7.8 billion have a cell phone we are kind of one big system now um so yeah i i do think and we are global citizens whether we admit it or not and whether we believe we are or not and so and, and towards that end i think we got to think about this you know stopping this pandemic it's great that the u.s now i think has enough vaccinations for everyone, but we better get to vaccinating everybody. I mean, I, I would have been in favor of trying to vaccinate the really vulnerable globally first, because frankly, it's also selfish. Like we can't stop a pandemic if there's places that aren't getting vaccinated because then there's more variants, like it just keeps bubbling, you know? So I think very quickly, we better show from the, from the wealthier countries that we're willing to donate a lot of doses around the world. We have to, again, I mean, we have to, it's just, it's ridiculous. We can't just lock ourselves in and go, we're all vaccinated, great. It just doesn't work that way, <laughs> you know, like, um, and same thing with that, with climate, with everything. It's just, you know, this is why this systems question, how do you think in systems, like everything is connected, which can be daunting, but, you know, you, you, you break down a problem, you work the problem, you know, and, and, you, and you get the right people at the table and you think as big as you can, and then you, you know, you divide it up into the, into the problem sets that you can handle. So yeah, we're, we're, we are connected and I find it kind of absurd to pretend we're not. It just it seems silly. Have you found that there's a way, I mean, you said systems thinking or thinking in this complexity can be daunting, but have you found some tools that are helpful over the years that make it easy? I, I have, I could tell you a couple uh, as well, but I, I was wondering what what have you found that's work? Is it a paradigm shift in thinking? Is it a different way of viewing the world? Or what tools are out there to kind of make it easy? Because in, in some some of those systems are running autonomously. We don't even know it that that we're dealing with every single day. And so if we can, you know, I, I just maybe we'll like to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of people working on systems thinking. I um. You know, I'm on the board of Forum for the Future. They're one of the good systems and scenarios thinking organizations. There's a lot of those, you know, a few kind of really great organizations that really do map systems very well and kind of show how everything's connected. Um, I don't know if there's any one. Look, there's there's great frameworks out there like the donut economics stuff from Kate Raworth. You know, there's there's always kind of evolution of, of new ways of thinking about it that help people kind of think in, in bigger picture. Um, I don't know, it's a funny, funny way to say it, but I don't know if there's a systematic way to think and to, to get people thinking in systems. There's, I, one of the things that I've, um, you know, read many times now is that a lot of this comes from empathy, right? We need more empathy and compassion. It is fundamentally what's the biggest lack. And in the US in particular, we've, we've moved away from empathy and compassion and this whole idea that, oh, if someone's on food stamps, it's them, it's other, it's not there's no sense of there, but for the grace of God, go I, you know, and I'm, I'm not a religious guy, but like a line like that is pretty powerful, <laughs> you know, like, like we all could be in a bad situation at some point in our lives. Um, so we, you know, you know, it's hard, it's hard to say how you bring about systems thinking. I think 
part of it is empathy. And one of the things I've read many times is that reading widely, reading fiction is actually been tied to empathy, get, seeing other people's views, reading from authors that are from different, you know, backgrounds than you. I just think, I think that's part of it, honestly, is sharing stories, is, is reading books um, by authors of very varying backgrounds and countries. And, and it just helps people kind of put themselves in other, other people's shoes. Um, and I think this, you know, this global connectivity that especially the younger generation is comfortable with, I think it helps. You know, you get to see you're sharing likes and dislikes with people around the world and you don't really care. You know, my, my sons both play games online they're often online playing with someone from Germany or Australia. I mean, like there's no border, right? It's just who likes Fortnite right now or who likes, you know, Magic the Gathering or whatever the games they're playing, playing people everywhere. Um, there's something kind of amazing about that, you know? And I think if we can lean into that and I think listen to Gen Z a lot more, they, they get something. There's something there that they get, right? I mean, the, they're pissed off and they should be, and they're making their voices heard. And I feel like, let's listen to them. Let's listen to how they think about the world. Um, you know, they're just so much more, my kids, no sense of gender stuff doesn't, they don't get why there's an issue around it. Like it just transgender, they meet, they, they know kids. Like, it's just not, none of that is weird to them. Um, and they don't doubt climate change. Like nobody, <laughs> like they know it's coming. Um, they're, they're, they're mad and they, they should be, right? But they, there's something there that they get that, you know, I don't think we do. Uh, um, out of all your wisdom, learnings, schooling, books, uh, and knowledge, would you put your finger on one of them that you say is the most influential or the aha moment for you where it just change, gave a change in your life and said, I can never look back or go back to that way of thinking again? Yeah, well, look, I think, and I'd love to hear your list too. And look, I think there's, you can say there's two kinds of people in the world, but I definitely find there's people who they read something and they can't forget it. Or they, you know, and then there's people who are very good at partitioning and going, okay, I read that thing about what's going on in the world or this climate book, and I'll just put it over here until I feel like thinking about it. I've never been that latter. I've always been one. Once I read it, it kind of just changes who I am. So the early when I got into this field in, in 2000, 2001, I was kind of transitioning, changing from regular business jobs. I didn't do anything in sustainability the first kind of 10 years of my work life. Um, I read, you know, the, the canon, right? Ecology of Commerce, Natural Capitalism was out right around, around then, um, Ishmael, which I'm sure you, you know, people, yep, yeah, Natural Capitalism, and I've gotten to know, you know, the authors. And Ishmael is an amazing kind of parable of just seeing the world differently. And for me, once I started reading about sustainability, like I couldn't go back, I couldn't go back to like, I'll just do a strategy job at a company because it was just so radically clear that the system we were in was broken and was never gonna get healthy. And thus we figured out a way for business to be part of the solution. So I think those early, you know, those early things were influences on me. And frankly, one of the most rewarding things in my career has been when people come up, um, to me and they read green to gold in grad school and they say this got me into this career this made me that's what i hope to do like that's the point of writing these things is like you you get people thinking differently and once they see it it's hard to it's hard to avoid but again i think there's also philosophy you know like uh you know i read victor frankl's man's search for meaning after a couple of years ago after going to auschwitz you know there's these books that just they they just speak to your soul in a way that that's kind of hard to how do you how do you read that and not come out of it yeah. about humanity and hope in the face of horror, you know, in a, in a different way. So I think there's just some of the philosophers that we need. Um, and we, we mentioned this briefly in the new book, but I, you know, there's just the, there's a couple key principles out there, like Rawls um, veil of ignorance, this idea of like, what kind of system would you design if you didn't know where you were going to be born? Um, and and were you, are you going to be born a white guy in a fairly wealthy country or, uh, a Syrian girl in a refugee camp, you know, like what, if you don't know where you're going to be born, what system would you build? I think that's one of like the most powerful thought experiment I, I maybe have ever seen. And it's, it is the classic empathy experiment. So those are the kinds of things that keep coming, I keep coming back to in my head and the surrender daily, I have to kind of come back to, which is let's remember what I can change. Cause I get pretty, get pretty angry. You get pretty frustrated. 
looking at the world and what's not changing and all that. So those are the things I, those are my touchstones, I guess. What are, what are the ones that you, you turn to? Oh, I have so many. I'm, I'm a book addict, so I'm addicted to all, all different types of books, but I'm a really big fan of, um, Carl Sagan, Lynn Margulis, um, Donella Meadows, Dennis mm -hmm. Meadows, your granders, obviously Paul Hawkins work as well. Um, Herman Daly, I have, uh, a, pretty much all his books and, and stuff that are more academic reads. I have tons of academic reads that don't, you know, kind of right now they cost you 120 to 300 euros to buy one of, one of these mm -hmm. books because I want to get into the understanding and a little bit deeper view uh, behind the, the systems and things. But there, there, there are so many, you know, even Carl Jung, the red book I have, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, book Libra and uh, old one is uh, um, that I really liked from a young age that I got from my from my parents is uh, Fritz Holt Capra. I'm actually a graduate from the Capra courses and it was a book uh, the the yeah I think it was the, the Tao of Physics is what it was called by Fritz Holt Capra was on my dad's bookshelf and and I read it back when I was younger, and and then later I took his course, the the systems view of life, and just different books like that. But the the real uh, one from a long time ago was Richard Bach Illusions, and Jonathan Livingston Siegel started out with those, and then obviously a lot of the business books, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, and Jim Rohn, kind of the business motivation type of things as well. But yeah, there, there are so many, and I'm an avid reader. I probably read three books a, a, a week, if, if wow. not. Yeah, so I'm, How do you I, do that? I mean, I, I, I've been hard. trying to make books more of a part of my life because there's so much information through email and newsletters. Like, you can fill your day with all that. I've been trying to make, for a long time, make books more a part of the day. You must not watch a lot of uh, Netflix and and. I don't. I don't. I don't watch TV and, and and very very little kind of very selective watches like I I try to watch some documentaries from people yeah. that I'll have on on the show and the the other reason why I read the books not only I want to kind of stay in the pulse but there are a lot of people who come on the podcast and I just you know they put years and uh, months of effort and, and dedication into a book I want to understand and, and um not not just be critical, but I want to kind of understand what they're thinking and the process is and be able to speak with them and ask them the right questions. So um, that's another reason why I read a lot. But I just got the bug probably about um, 15 years ago uh, and I can't stop. And, and it's getting it's getting worse. I have a, a book addiction, I must say, for sure. I have the hardest question for you today. It's the one I ask all my guests and it's probably it'll get you off the hook when you're done with it. And it's the burning question, WTF. What's the future is, is the, the burning question. It's not the other one that we've all been swearing and asking this year, but it's really the one, what's what's a roadmap? What's the plan? What's the future? Uh, it's funny, you know, because a lot of my work is speaking and writing and, and, you know, every now and then a speaker's bureau, someone will book me as like a futurist. I don't really think that's what I do. I, I, I call myself a presentist. I don't know if I can coin it or something, but it's more about, I'm talking about trends we can already see, like the clean economy trends. Just look at the last 10 years and it's like pretty clear what's happening to the price of, you know, renewables. So I think some of the things I, I can predict are, are mostly just pretty clear connections to what we're already seeing. Um, with hopefully, I hope I'm a little better than average at getting out of linear thinking and, and understanding because we as a species are bad at exponential thinking, right? It's really hard to, you know, the, the famous lily pad pond thing, like you don't realize like you're, you're at some huge scale until like a day or two before. If it's doubling every day, it happens so fast at the end. So I think, you know, I, I will say with some confidence that the speed of change, the volatility isn't going away. I don't see how it can, that the speed of technology continues, the, the speed of the clean economy continues. So I, I'm pretty confident that at some point, you know, whether it's 10 years or 20, there's almost no combustion cars on the road. Um, there's a grid that's almost entirely renewables with batteries, et cetera. 
I, I think that's all going to happen. I mean, it's already on its way. Um, you can try to protect fossil fuels, but the economics are just, it's over, right? The economics are done. We're at a point where the renewables are basically cheaper to build and the, you know, using the economic term, the variable cost of renewables is zero. It takes, you know, you spend zero on, on sun and wind. That's hard to beat. So I'm confident about that. Um, I'm also confident that the expectations of kind of business and organizations about what's in their sphere. Um, and this is what the book's about. So I, I guess I hope this is true, but I believe that the sphere of what companies are expected to be about is just growing. And, and they are diving into things like democracy because I think increasingly it's expected that they will do that. Um, I also, am, unfortunately, I'm, I'm pretty confident just because the science is there that we've locked in some bad stuff um, that we can't get away from. I, I say this, you know, it's a personal kind of tragedy for me. I was born in South Florida. Um, you know, I'm not down there very often, but I have a kind of feeling for the place, you know, and I think a lot of that area in South Florida will be underwater. I, I don't think Miami's functional in 30, 40 years. It's hard to see how. I mean, I, I, I guess we could be surprised and maybe there'll be some massive sequestration effort, but I think we've locked in some things that we better get a handle on. Um, I think, unfortunately, there will also be a lot more refugees. I mean, you've seen the numbers. There could be one to three billion people living in places that may be not functional. I, I don't see any indication we're going to get close to 1.5 degrees. We're just, we're not even close. I, I hope we hold to two. Um, so I think the world's going to be tough. I, 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 can't, I can't see any other way. We waited too long. Um, but I have to believe that, you know, like Churchill said about Americans, you know, humans will do the, will do the right thing once we've tried everything else. Like we will, I do believe we will get there. We will have this clean economy, a clean grid. The world will generally get more equal. Well, the, you know, the arc of justice, you know, uh, all of that. Um, but there's a lot of two steps forward, three steps back, two step, you know, like we're in some backlash moments now. So I, I think, you know, Again, I'm confident about some things, less confident about others. Um, but then there's wild cards, you know, like the pandemic was predictable, but boy, did it change some things. Like I was totally confident urbanization statistics were gonna go in one direction. Now I'm not anymore because people are like, oh, I can work remotely and people are leaving cities, right? And moving to remote places. You don't know, something can happen. It's the unknown unknowns, I guess. Um, but like I said, the world's gonna be cleaner. It's gonna be greener. It's gonna be healthier. Um, but the major challenges we're gonna face are what do we do when a lot of people gotta move and we have to ex kind of help each other um, and really help parts of the world that become unlivable. And I, I honestly do not know what's gonna happen. We don't have a great track record with refugees or welcoming in people. And I don't know, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen there. So again, I have this kind of range of what I feel confident saying and what I don't, um, but we will always be a mix of, of um, of selfishness and and love and care, that's us. I mean, we are all of that. We're it's not one or the other. Um, you know, I hope we can start to see that selfishness actually it is selfish to be um, giving. It is selfish to give yourself to others because you're happier, you do better, and that's the whole net positive philosophy, right? You you serve everybody, you do better. That's that's the logic. It's also back to uh, Paul's wife, Kim Pullman, wrote The Imaginal Cell with Many yeah. Greats and The Golden Rule, you know, treat people on planet how you would like to be treated. I think that's great. The, the, I, I, you shocked me a little bit. I'm glad you gave me that honest answer. Yeah. And, and there's that underpinning as well. But w with the big pivot, I, I'm hoping that, that, that not only because what we've experienced with the pandemic and, and so many other things that have all been on the exponential function, the exponential curve, that we'll realize that that's not just a doom and gloom negative curve. There's also the complete flip side. Right. If we figure it out quick enough, apply the things that are in your book, in, in your coming book, and and uh, even just go back to the basics, you know, the golden rule, which you summed up your 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 answer to my question, um, that we can hit that exponential curve. And, and no, we might not make it. We might fall short and, and experience some things. But I think 
that would get us in, into a better spot in the future. And it will also give us hope to, to, to grasp, embrace that. I mean, we've seen it with uh, world wars where we've pivoted, but there were also some pretty quick pivots during the pandemic. And, and maybe we also realize how quickly the exponential function works. So I, I don't have too much more to say about that. I, I appreciate your answer. We could get off on another whole tangent on that as well. Um, the last three questions I have are really for my listeners. If, if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Well, I, I mean, it sounds really trite, but I think, you know, when you start talking about these huge systems and democracy and, and changing carbon around the world, it can sound like, oh, what can I possibly do? And I guess, you know, this is so trite in the kind of thousand things you can do to save the planet, but just that everybody, you don't have to be a CEO, you don't have to be the president, like everybody has a role to play, meaning the, the pressure you can put on um, your employer, you know, on, on the, the companies you buy from and work for is real and it adds up. Like again, Amazon employees got together and took one of the biggest companies in the world and brought it into the world, brought it into the climate world after they did nothing. Um, so there's just this incredible power I think people don't realize they have that it doesn't actually take that many voices making noise about something to change behavior. There's lots of studies showing that, that you know, if you go into a store and say, why don't you carry this? It doesn't take that many people asking actually before, before it changes. So I think we have to realize that we can all expect more, you know, of each other, of our, of our politicians, of our leaders, of our CEOs. So that's, I just think you have more power than you realize. Like, you know, we're one of 8 billion people, right? I mean, nobody matters if you look at it that way, but like you do, you do have an influence. Um, and that's kind of, and I think, you know, you gotta think you know, carefully about how you vote and the kinds of people you put in place. So that's, you know, to me, Again, it's been used in sustainability or green thinking forever, but your, you know, your vote, your, your work matters. That's kind of the, I guess, the simple takeaway. What should young innovators in, in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make real impacts? Well, I, I think, uh, I mean, I talked to a lot of grad students that contact me, how do I get into this or what do I do with companies and sustainability? I and mean, there's lots of different paths. I think one thing is to realize that given how vast the, the work is, there's a million paths. You don't have to be in the sustainability department of company or at a sustainability consulting firm to be doing sustainability. The, the companies that get it, they need people everywhere in the business. Banks need people who get it. Like you can go into many things and do it. Um, but um, I think the thing to focus on if I were training now you know, in, in school would be um, systems thinking, right? Thinking about how things connect. I don't think our schools are, we don't teach it really well. I think there's more of it now maybe than there used to be, but it's not, we teach linearly, right? I think there's systems thinking. And the other real skill set is, is partnerships, is thinking about things as collaborations, not as, you know, every man for themselves and developing those skills of partnering, of the kind of humility and openness and transparency that's needed to have a good partnership you know, just like a good marriage, I guess, you know, like you, you need to be open and say, I don't know, I don't know how to do this. Can you help? Um, you know, here's what we need help with. Uh, that's hard for a lot of people, right? They don't want to look dumb or something. So I think those skills, and I actually have a lot of hope that the, the, again, Gen Z, because they're growing up so connected, that the idea of uh, using a network to solve something will just be natural, right? I mean, they, like I said, they, they, they're playing games with people all over the world, they're being taught from the beginning in school now to do group projects, the kind of stuff I didn't get, get to like business school. They do it from like second grade now, right? And learn all the things about like, oh, this person's not doing their share, that sucks. You know, like they're learning all the things about working together. And I think they're just more naturally connected. They'll, they'll just think to reach out to someone and post something or, so I think I have hope that they will have that kind of skill. So again, it's partnerships, it's, it's being able to collaborate and to think in systems. Those are the two massive skill sets that we need. And it sounds like uh, definitely the right, uh, your book is, is going to touch on those things yeah. uh, as well. So I'm excited in September when that comes out. The last question is really, what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey, your long journey so far that you would have loved to know from the beginning, from the start? Um, it's a good question. I guess when I look back now, 
there's this sense, especially like when I made this right turn, I had been working in, um, I worked at Boston Consulting Group, I worked in media companies. I had kind of this kind of path of working on strategy and marketing. And I decided during the dot-com crash, I was at a small dot-com and we crashed to take a right turn, go back to school, learn environmental studies. And I really didn't know if there'd be a career out of it. And I think the major lesson I learned was that even if you take a right turn, whatever you've done, you will use. It, it, it is part of your skill set and what you know. And so when I think about people like, oh, I can't change because I've gotten this many years in something. Like when I came to write Green to Gold, I think part of what helped make it successful was I came from consulting and marketing and didn't come from Greenpeace, right? Like I, I, I think that's part of the, I used the things that I had been working on strategy and marketing and, and brand development in the writing. And, and so I, I kind of always tell people like, you don't need to have it all figured out and have the exact right path. There is no one right path. You're gonna use everything you've learned down the road. And so just get moving, just go do something, right? And I, that was a, a huge lesson for me that you don't, you don't lose it just because you change paths, you know? You, you, will still, you will still use it and, and it will, it'll make you unique and have kind of this combination of skills that are only yours. And that, there, there's kind of that little hidden message in there as well, because that ties into that systems thinking. So in your journey, you've connected the dots, the system, and how, how can you apply it, which is really how it needs to do and, and how, how it needs to function. Andrew, it's been a sheer pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. And I hope that we, uh, in September, can talk about your new book, uh, Net Happy Positive. Too. It'll be great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.